Okay, we're in um, Luke chapter seven, or excuse me, Luke chapter six. We haven't finished the chapter yet, and um, we'll finish that tonight. Luke chapter six. And we ended down in verse 36, but let's start, let's start reading in verse 37 just to get some context. And um, you guys know that this is the um, Sermon on the Plain, and uh, Jesus is basically going through and, and uh, talking about judgment um, in this passage. And so um, let's go through and, and hit on that, and uh, let's pray before we do, though. Father, we uh, come before you and thank you for your word again. Um, Lord, uh, we thank you that um, when we go through the Bible, and especially in those places, Lord, where, where you're the one speaking, it's pretty cool uh, to see the things that you have to say. And uh, actually, most of the rest of the Bible is just kind of an offshoot of those things anyway. And Lord, as we go through and uh, look at your words in the sermon, um, Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to take them to heart and be real about them. And uh, Father, that you would bless us because um, we're listening up to what you have to say. And so we just uh, give you the time, pray that you uh, speak to our hearts and that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, in uh, verse 37, Jesus says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And he spoke a parable to them saying, uh, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not uh, perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a br uh, bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks." And so Jesus is going through and um, just talking about uh, uh, judgment and, and um, obviously that kind of thing. We've already kind of covered that. Um, one of the things that um, we run into all the time when we're talking to people is that basically you have a situation where um, every unbeliever has these kinds of passages memorized. In fact, a lot of times it's the only verse in the Bible that they know. Well, judge not that you be not judged and that kind of thing. And what happens is it gets taken out of context. And when Jesus is talking about judgment, it is the word for judgment. It's the same word that's, it's krino in Greek. It's the same word that's used for judgment all the way through the Bible. There's some other words that are also used. There's a different word that's used for condemn and, and so on. But there's, there's a context um, to, to the teaching on judgment depending on where you're at. And so judgment in Greek is not any different basically than judgment in English. And so if I come up to you and I see you in a situation where you're being condemnatory to somebody and I go, don't judge, that's one thing. But if at another time I come up to you and I see you in a situation where you should have been paying attention to what was going on around you and I say, why don't you use some judgment? You follow? There's two, two, two completely different contexts and both of those things are absolutely valid. But judgment has a, a different meaning in the one context than it does in the other. Well, it's the same thing in the Bible. And so when, when the Bible talks about judgment, there are passages where it talks about don't judge, but then there are other passages where it talks about do judge. And actually, in this passage right here, Jesus deals with both, both don't judge and do judge, all in the same passage. And so um, again, uh, the, the point is that when Jesus is saying judge not and you shall not be judged in that passage, it's not the idea that you never use judgment and you never look at somebody's life and you never inspect fruit. He talks about inspecting fruit later on. It's not talking about that. It's just talking about have a, having a condemnatory attitude. And you see that in the very next verses. There's a passage in John chapter seven, verse 24, where, where Jesus says, do not judge according to appearance, judge according to righteous judgment. And way too often what people do is they judge according to appearance. And it's, it's not supposed to be happening that way. Um, I'll, I'll just give you an example. I went to um, 
uh, a camp when I was a high school leader and um, we went to a place called Catalina. It's down in Southern California. It's an island off the coast. So I took my, all my kids to Catalina. And when we got there, um, I was uh, uh, in a group of kids. Actually, it was a couple of different churches that had gotten together. And I was in this group of kids. And there were these uh, two kids. It was back in like the mid 80s. And there were these two kids with like weird haircuts. And the girl, um, uh, she was sitting, in there, sitting there in worship and she had her hair pulled over. Literally the whole side of her head was shaved off. Okay, and so it was an in-style haircut back at that day, but it was really edgy. It was like punk rock type stuff. And then the, the guy had this um, uh, mohawk that was like this tall and they're both sitting there. And so when we're doing worship, I'm sitting there looking at them and, I'm going, and I, I just begin to pray for them. Very spiritual thing for me to do. And so I begin to pray for them and ask God to just be working in their hearts and drawing them to the Lord and stuff like that. So later on, me and my wife go on a walk and there, there was this place at the camp where there was a cross up on the hill. And so we just decided to walk up there. And before we got there, we were in the bushes. There's brush around it. And so you couldn't see what was there. Um, when, I mean, you could see the cross, but you couldn't see who was sitting around it. And as we're walking up, we hear two kids praying around the cross. So, you know, just kind of stop and I'm listening to what they're saying. And it was just awesome prayers. You know, they're just in love with the Lord. You could really tell, right? And so I walk into the little clearing around the cross. Guess who's sitting there? Yeah, it's those two kids. And I'm just like, and God just nails me and just goes, don't you judge according to appearance. You judge with righteous judgment. You know, pay attention here. And that's basically the idea behind that. Um, he says, condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And um, last week we talked about that. So I'm not gonna go over that a whole lot, except that forgiveness towards others is something that God connects with forgiveness from him. And he does it all the time. We have it in the Lord's prayer. Um, forgive my debts as I forgive my debtors, right? That's what we pray. And it's the only part of the Lord's prayer that Jesus chose to comment on. And he said, if you don't forgive others their debts, neither will your father in heaven, their trespasses, neither will your father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. And so obviously forgiveness is not an option in a believer's life. It needs to be done. And Jesus talked about um, how that's to be done, done in Matthew chapter 18. He goes on here and, and uh, in verse 38 says, give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And all this is in the context of what you put out is what you're gonna get back. You reap what you sow. And so if you sow judgment, you're gonna reap judgment. If you sow condemnation, you're gonna reap condemnation. If you sow unforgiveness, you're gonna reap unforgiveness. On the other hand, if you sow to the spirit, then God's going to press down into your bosom. Um, when he says give here, um, it's, it, it's, it's probably talking about monetary giving, obviously. It's, ta it's talking about somebody who has a giving heart and that kind of thing. But it's not just, you know, I mean, you, you can't just confine it to the area of money. And a lot of people do that. They'll confine it to the area of money and say things like, if you give a whole bunch of money, then God's going to give it back to you. And so if you want to get rich off of God, then go out and be a giver. And they'll, they'll use verses like this. And obviously that's not the point of what Jesus is saying. But the whole idea of just being somebody who is giving is something that, that God watches out for. And when you pour out into people's lives, then you can be absolutely sure that God is gonna be pouring, out, pouring back into your life. There's a passage, one of my favorite verses is in the book of Proverbs. And it says, the liberal soul will be made fat and he who waters will be watered himself. You ever feel dry and, and thirsty and starving and that kind of thing spiritually? And a lot of times the reason that people do that, um, you know, you can go to Bible study after Bible study and lift, listen to teaching after teaching and there's still this blank spot in your life and this empty, the emptiness that's inside. You know Jesus and you're following him, but it's like, it, no, it, it, it's like you're, you, you just feel like you're getting nothing from God. And part of the reason for that is because of whether or not you're giving. And so one of the things that um, you know, I find in my own life is that God pours stuff out on me. And it's because of that right there. 
I make it, make it a practice, you know, what we're supposed to be doing is serving others. That's what's supposed to be happening. And so you spend your time serving others and you put others first and that kind of thing. And you can expect God to, to uh, do it back for you. Um, it also is given in the context of monetary stuff. And it's the same principle that you see all the way through the Bible. So there's a passage over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. You can turn over there if you want. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 11. And you can read it in your Bible. I'm going to read it to you in the New Living Translation, uh, just to get more of a, you know, like a, like a common generic English. And in, six, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, it says this, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. That makes sense, right? You know, if you're going to, if you're going to go plant corn, you don't plant one kernel. Okay, you're going to plant a bunch and you're going to plant them in rows so you can get a, a good crop. He says, verse 7, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. And it's a great principle. And one of the things that you see in uh, many believers' lives, and I know guys like this, I know why God has blessed them financially, and it's because of that situation. Now, he hasn't blessed them because they figured out this principle, and so they started giving so that God would give, him, give them more, and then they just make sure that they're doing the giving thing so that God will give them more. They just have a generous heart. And so when God sees somebody who is going to invest in the way that he would like things invested, he feels free to give them more resources to do that with. And here's, here again is the point. When I, when I give, I can, I can expect that God is never going to be my debtor. He's always going to be taking care of me. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of that situation. God watches for people with giving hearts and as they give, he, put, he pours more into their life and they're able to give more. And that's what we're supposed to be as believers. Imagine, if, again, if everybody was like that, right? And God, God could do that with anybody. But God is not a dummy. He's not sitting up there in heaven going, oh, look, they're giving. And so now I'm forced to give back to them. And whether or not their motives are correct or whether or not this whole thing is going to destroy them, I'm going to have to give them money because they're already giving. And that's a lot of the stuff that you see on TV. And it's just nonsense. One of the things that the Bible's really clear about is that the fact that money can destroy people. And so um, there are, you know, literally people who will stop following Jesus based on money. Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon, and literally means riches. You cannot serve God and riches because you're going to hate the one and you're going to love the other. Okay. And so there's a real danger in riches. But if riches are something that you have and you use them in the way that God calls you to, and riches are not something that have you, then you're gonna be okay. And it's gonna be a cool thing. There's another passage in Malachi 3, 8 through 10. <clears throat> and again, it, it illustrates the same, same principle that Jesus is talking about. And in Malachi 3, 8 through 10, this again is in the New Living Translation. It says, should people cheat God, yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try me, put me to the test. So again, you have that same principle. If you have a giving heart, then what God's going to do is he's going to give to you. Again, he's never your debtor. So again, reading this, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you, okay? And so uh, again, um, 
talking about the area of finances in that passage, but it's in other areas too. And so if we have giving hearts in the areas of ministry to other people, then you can expect God to minister to you. Like I said before, the liberal soul will be made fat and he who waters will be watered himself. If you're not getting watered, then maybe the issue is you're not watering. If you're not liberal, and I'm not talking about politically, if you're not liberal, if you're not giving, then that may, may be why God's not giving to you. And so um, good, good biblical principle there, right? And then he goes on here and he says, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? And I love that story. Actually, it was in a different, Jesus um, quoted this a couple of different times. Actually, he said it a couple of different times. In one context, um, he was talking about the doctrine of the, of the Pharisees. And he basically said, don't pay any attention to the doctors, uh, doctrine of the Pharisees. They're blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall into the ditch. And that's actually a, per, a pretty hilarious proverb. Can you imagine somebody who's absolutely blind going, here, come with me, grabbing somebody else who's absolutely blind and trying to get any place? It would be ridiculous, right? I, had a, uh, I got a friend of mine. Um, he's a pastor down in, actually, Dennis Davenport. Um, oh, I, I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, but anyways, pastor down in uh, Southern California, and we were uh, driving somewhere. I can't remember where we were driving, but we're on the freeway, and we hit the rumble strip. You know, the strip on the side of the road, you know, you know what the rumble strip is, right? It goes, brrr, you know, that kind of thing. And so um, we, I, I veered over, and I hit that. And so he starts talking about this um, situation with his wife in the rumble strip. And what had happened was um, he, she was driving down the road. She kept hitting it. And Dennis is like, what are you doing? Why do you keep hitting the rumble strip? And she goes, what are, what's a rumble strip? And he goes, you know that sound that the tires make when you get off the side of the road? It's to wake you up in case, you, you know, in case you're, you're veering off the road. It's to let you know that you're in danger of going off the road. And she said, wow, I never knew that. That would be great for blind people. <laughs> and she... <laughs> And then she thought about it for a second and then revised her comments, <laughs> extended her remarks and, and stuff. But it's a, it's a great picture. The blind leading the blind, they'll both fall into the ditch. And Jesus goes on in verse 40 and he says, the disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And so obviously as believers, um, what we're supposed to be doing is being like Jesus and anything less than that is spiritual blindness and it leads to the ditch. Um, he goes on in verse 41 and says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye um, when you yourself do not see the plank that's in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now, I worked in construction, and uh, I always tell, I always tell the story. I used to get um, sawdust in my eyes all the time. And uh, I didn't always wear my sunglasses and that kind of stuff. My protective glasses, never wore those. You know, they always show you that on the, on the shows and stuff, but I never, I never wore those. And a lot of times I, I would be wearing sunglasses because of uh, framing, you know, on concrete and stuff like that. It was just glare type stuff. And so that would protect your eyes. But there were times when I would be doing certain things and you needed to wear glasses. And so cutting stairs was one of those. You, you, you cut these, 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 they're called stair horses that you put your stairs on. And when you cross cut um, lumber, what happens is it throws up sawdust. And it's the same thing with working with redwood. Redwood is horrendous. You gotta wear sun, or you gotta wear glasses when you're doing redwood because it gets in your eyes and it just stings like no other. And so there would be times when I was working on something like that and I would get something in my eye and um, I would, you know, I'd have all these tricks to get it out. And so one of the tricks is you could take your top eyelid and pull it over your bottom eyelid and it'll pull the stuff off and that kind of stuff. And if it got bad enough, I'd go rinse my, my eye out with water. One time I was working underneath a, a, a house um, pounding nails and I got a piece of galvanized, uh, the, the, they were galvanized nails. And so I got a piece of the galvanized metal and it fell off in my eye and literally uh, uh, like a little splinter went into my eye wouldn't go away. I had, to, I had to go to the eye doctor and he plucked it out and then showed it to me after the fact. So you get stuff in your eyes. And when you get stuff in your eyes, you want it out. And so Jesus isn't saying here, don't look at the speck in your brother's eye and ever go up to him and try to help him get it out. 
Because when, you're, when he was a carpenter, he knows, he knows, he's got the experience there. When you get something in your eye, you would like to get it out. I, would, I always tried to get it out myself first. And if I couldn't get it out myself, sometimes I'd go to my, you know, my friends on the job and they'd come up and they'd try to get it out for me. I had one guy come up and he said, oh, you got something in your eye? He pulls out his utility knife and goes, let me come. You know. I'm like, get away from me, you maniac, right? That's, that's what we would always do. But when you get something in your eye, you want it out. You just don't want the guy taking it out to be somebody who has a two by four hanging out of his eye. It's not gonna work because the junk in his eye makes it so that he can't see clearly to do anything for you. And so Jesus isn't even talking about, you got a two by four in your eye, you are not competent and you are not qualified to take the speck out of anybody else's eye. What he says is dummy, that's what hypocrite means in Greek. I'm just joking. <laughs> but dummy, get the board out of your own eye first, and then you can see clearly to th take the speck out of somebody else's eye. And so again, it's, it, it's a, there's a context there. And it, you know, if you're, if you're doing all these unbiblical things and you have this unbiblical lifestyle and you have all these unbiblical attitudes and you're gonna come up and you're gonna start reaming somebody for something that they have done, it's dumb because they're not gonna to listen to you in the first place. They're just gonna go, get away from me. You got a plank in your eye, right? And so it'd be better to take the plank out of your own eye so you can see clearly to remove the speck from somebody else's eye. Good principle, right? Then he goes on and says in verse 43, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Um, I have bad trees at my house. One of them, um, I believe, is called the tree of heaven. Is that right? Is that what that is? I hear that around here, tree of heaven. They grow everywhere. They're like weeds. They make me crazy. And they grow down and they got this one long root that takes off and it's got all kinds of little shoots that come up. And every time I see one of those things, it, you know, if, it, if, if you just leave it for a couple of weeks, the thing is this tall. And then you got to take your truck, wrap a chain around it, yank the thing out. I hate these things. And the other ones that I hate are Russian olives. Oh, I can't stand Russian olives. And they grow, and again, they grow like weeds. And you're never going, you know what's not on Russian olives? Olives. What in the world do we call it an olive tree for if it doesn't grow olives? And it's a bad tree. You're not gonna get any kind of good fruit from an, a Russian olive tree, and you're not gonna get any good fruit from a tree of heaven. Who named it tree of heaven? It's the tree from hell. That's what it is. So anyway, bad trees don't bear um, good fruit, and good trees don't bear bad fruit. One of the things with, with uh, Russian olives is they have all these spiky branches and all of, all of this stuff. It's just a big weed. But then you have peach trees. And peaches are my favorite fruit, and I love peach trees. I can spot them, a peach tree a mile off. And I've got an orchard in my, in, in my backyard and we've got peach trees and we've got plums and we've got apricots and we've got cherries, pie cherries, and we've got Bing cherries. Those are a little intense. You gotta make sure you spray them. Otherwise you get little other things with your cherries like maggots, maggots grow in the cherries. You know what um, or, organic cherries are? They're cherries with protein in them. <laughs> just messing around but anyway we, you know I've got all kinds of trees that bear really good fruit and they're just awesome just just love them but uh, uh, you know an apricot tree does not bear thorns and a Russian olives does not bear apricots and the same thing with and you know again Jesus uses this agri agricultural example to show you what goes on in people's lives and he says for every tree is known by its own fruit Men don't gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And that's another one of those principles that you pay, pay attention to. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses that same illustration for false prophets. He's, he talks about good trees don't bring forth bad fruit, bad, for, bad trees don't bring go, forth good fruit. And in this passage, he specifically talks about the things that are coming out of the guy's mouth as what the fruit is. 
So there's fruit that comes out of people's mouths and you can understand where their heart is by what comes out of their mouth, right? And it's not saying that people can't be hypocrites and they can't be people who fake you out and that kind of thing, but there's going to come a time where you really see what they are and it, and it takes place because of what is said. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so obviously, if you're talking about a false prophet, sooner or later, false prophecies are going to come out of his mouth. It's the fruit of a prophet. If you're talking about a false teacher, sooner or later, false teaching is going to come out of his mouth. If you're talking about a non-Christian, there's going, you know, you can, you can sit there and talk with people and they can say all the right words, but if they don't know Jesus, sooner or later, it's going to become abundantly clear that they don't know him. And the fruit is going to be what comes out of their mouth. Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And I'm not talking about just, you know, just necessarily a situation where they blew it or they sinned or that kind of thing. What I'm talking about is a life. You, 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 can, you can trick people for a certain period of time, but sooner or later, stuff's gonna come out that lets you know exactly where they stand on an issue, right? And it's the same thing, um, uh, obviously, with us. Now, um, so when you're, when you're looking at the fruit in a person's life, it's the things that come out of their mouth. The Bible talks about the tongue is a great evil. It's a poison. It's set on fire by hell. No man can tame the tongue. For, it, for with it, we bless God and we curse men. And so there's this whole thing with the tongue that you have to watch out for. And that's talking about in the context of Christians. But again, you can't fake people out for long. And so if I don't have a heart that's turned towards God, and if I have a heart that's turned away from God, sooner or later, that's going to become evident, and it's going to become evident because of the things that I, because of the things that I say. So we as Christians, according to Jesus, are supposed to be fruit inspectors. And that fruit is not going to just be stuff that they do. That's part of it. But that it's not going to just be stuff that they do. It's also going to be stuff that they say, right? And so we're supposed to be discerning. Um, we talked about this morning in, um, in, the, in the book of uh, Revelation, Ephesus is commended because they tested those who, were, who said that they were apostles and they were not, and they found them to be liars. And so once again, when you're, when you're looking at a situation um, in, in church and in the kingdom of God and, and that kind of thing, um, we're not in a situation here where everybody is going to come in and just let you know what's going on from their heart in the sense of uh, they're not just gonna be up front. Jesus warns about hypocrites. He warns about false teachers. He warns about wolves. And he says that we need to be on the watch for them. And this is the way that you watch for them, okay? Now, here's another thing with this. When I first got saved, um, uh, you know, you, you guys know my story. I came out of a completely non-Christian background, which means that I had all kinds of stuff that I was doing before I was a Christian that I carried on into my Christian life. So before I was a Christian, the F word was a, you know, a necessary portion of my vocabulary. And I used it all the time. I didn't use it in the presence of girls most often. So I could control myself, but I used it all the time. The S word, same thing. I cussed like crazy. That's what I grew up with. My mom called me all kinds of cuss words growing up. It's just what I grew up with. And so when I become a Christian, one of the things that I figured out real quick, I knew this. One of the things I figured out real quick was my language needed to change. Okay, um, I'm, I'm making a point of this. When I became a Christian, I knew immediately that my language needed to change. The reason I'm saying that to you is because there's some pastors who think that their language doesn't need to change and they're nothing but posers. Don't listen to people like that. I, I was listening to one Bible study by you know, uh, uh, one famous guy who was into that and he was saying that Jesus said the F word and that Jesus used the S word in his culture. And it was just a blasphemous Bible study. It was messed up because Jesus didn't do any of that. And so the Bible talks about uh, the, thing, the fact that the things that come out of my mouth need to be edifying. And I'm not to be, I'm not to be somebody that has that kind of language. And it's just, you know, common sense. You know, I can't go effing this and you're a blank and you're a this and all of that kind of stuff and expect that people are going to take me seriously in a walk with Christ, right? So I get saved. 
and I've got this cussing problem, and what I do is I try to fix it. I realize I'm, I need to follow Jesus, and I need to take care of the whole cussing thing. And so what I try to do is I try to control my language. And I would go to church on Sunday, and I would have a really good time at church on Sunday, I would be really encouraged, and then I'd go, okay. And I, you know, this was just a real struggle with me. i go, okay, this week, I'm not cussing. I'm not gonna do this stuff. And so I go out on Monday to school. I was in high school at the time. I go out on Monday to school and I go, okay, not cussing today. And you know what? I'd make it all the way through Monday, all the time. I'd always make it through Monday. And then Tuesday would come along. And at the time that I was struggling with this, I was um, uh, uh, on the track team and I was a pole vaulter of all things. I know that that's hard to believe, but I was. I was a pole vaulter. And pole vaulting is highly frustrating. Because what, you know, all kinds of things can happen. And, you know, it's like, it's like you're running down with this, you know, this 16 foot pole and you hit the box and everything's got to go perfectly. Your legs have to go perfectly. Your hands have to be perfect. You have to have upper body strength and all this stuff to get in the right position. If you don't hold the pole right, then you go shooting off to the side somewhere. Okay, if you, you can, if you don't hit the box right, you don't swing up, you don't have much, uh, enough momentum, you can go up a, uh, to a certain height and you don't hit the pits, you don't hit the pads. You literally come straight down in the box. And there were all kinds of times when I would go up and I didn't have enough momentum, I wasn't running fast enough when I hit the box and I'd go straight up, I'd be upside down and I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> this is not gonna be good. Turn around and you're literally holding the pole as you're coming down, trying to slide down this thing so you, don't, so you don't bust yourself up in the box. It's really frustrating, really frustrating. And when you're, when you're pole vaulting and you can't get 12 feet, you know, for a warm up, it makes you nuts and stuff. And so what I would do is I'm going in and I'm pole vaulting and stuff. And so we're practicing and all these things are going wrong. And pretty soon I'm just like, ah! you know, throwing the pole and out of Steve's mouth comes, blah, 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 blah. You know, and I'm like, oh. And that's usually Tuesday or Wednesday. And then Thursday would come along and I try a little bit, and by Friday I'm just done. And I'm dragging myself into church on Sunday going, what is wrong with me? I'm, you know, I'm just messed up. And so then I, I'd be there on Sunday and I'd get all encouraged, and then we'd start the process the next time. And so I tried all kinds of stuff. And so I tried counting to 10. Okay, because my grandma would say that to me. You need to count to 10. And so I'd start getting frustrated and I'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Did that work? No, never worked. Never, never worked. I tried biting my tongue. Literally, I tried to bite my tongue. Things would start to come out and I'd just go, and you know, not that obvious, but I would bite my tongue to try to stop myself from doing that stuff. Did that work? No, it didn't work. And you know what the problem was? I read this verse for the, for the very first time. It was literally the first time that I'd ever read it. You remember, I'm a brand new Christian. I don't know my Bible. I read this verse for the very first time and I read it and I go, and, and Jesus says um, in the passage, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And I was like, oh, that's the problem. I have a filthy heart. And so what's happening here is I got this stuff going on inside and it's just going to come out and I can't keep it from coming out. You ever been mad at somebody and just kind of been mulling over what you were gonna to say to them if you ever got an opportunity, right? Just kind of mull it over for a couple of weeks and all of a sudden you get into some kind of little conflict with your mom or with your dad or with your brother or with your sister and all of a sudden all the stuff that you were thinking just comes out blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh man, I wasn't really gonna say that. Well, it was floating around in your heart and that's why it came out, right? And so once I, once I read that, I was like, wow, okay. So my problem is not that I can control my tongue. Can anyone control their tongue? The Bible says no, it's an unruly evil. It can't be controlled. It's in James chapter three. The whole first section of that passage talks about the control of the tongue. You can't control your tongue. It's not going to happen. And so what you have to do is not try to control the outflow of what comes from your tongue. What you're supposed to control is the fountain. 
so that anything that comes out is something that's already there. And that's the way that it's supposed to work. And when I did that, uh, when I realized that, what I did was I just went, Jesus, obviously I got a filthy heart and that's why the filth comes out of my mouth. Will you please change my heart? And I started asking, you know, praying and asking God to move on the inside of me instead of trying to control what came out on the outside of me. And so some of you guys, um, and, and a lot of times this is, a, this is a guy thing, you have a problem with this kind of stuff. These things come out every once in a while. And the reason that, that they come out is because they're in. That's why. And so that's why it, that's why it comes out. Later on, um, as I got older in the Lord, that become, became less of an issue, which is an encouragement to you if you're struggling with that, because God can take care of it. It became less of an issue. And actually the cussing became a no issue type of thing. And it's not that that stuff hasn't ever been in my mind from that point on, but as soon as it comes in my mind, what I do is I go, I take my thoughts captive and I go, God, that's not glorifying. It's not something that I want to be saying. It's not something that I want to be thinking. Will you please take it away? And I just deal with it in the area of the mind so that I don't ever have to deal with it on the area of the tongue in that situation. And so I've, ha I've had these tests over the years. I worked in construction and every time I would hit my thumb or my finger, actually it's this finger and you shave the side of, off it when you hit it. Every time that I would hit my finger, it was a test, not as to whether or not I was still a Christian because I didn't cuss out loud. It was a test as to whether I was still a Christian because did I cuss in my head? That's what I was always looking for. And so what I would do is I'm, I'm a vocal person. And so when I would hit myself, I would scream and it would be, ow! And I would scream, you know, if it was bad enough, I'd just scream really loud. And um, I literally had one uh, guy who was a brother, he was a, he was a Christian. Um, he looked at me one time and he goes, is that what you were saying on the inside? And, you know, obviously I'm checking out my heart and it's like, yeah, that's what I was saying. On the inside I was saying, ow! That's what it was. And so that's how you control your tongue. That's how you get rid of that kind of stuff. Um, there, there was an old song and actually um, it was uh, something that I heard at the same time that I was uh, dealing with this. And it was a song called Abiding. It was by a group named Daniel Amos. And they had just really awesome lyrics. And this one lyric went like this. Now a Christian sister um, whose name was Sue, oh, what was it? No, Sister Sue had a problem too. Though not like Ben, she kept her cool. But when it came to gossip, man, that gal, gal could rap. Um, she found it hard to say something kind and wound up hurting someone every time with a juicy story. She just couldn't shut her trap. Now Sue found the secret to taking God's rest and instead of making promises and doing her, her best, she let the Lord take her tongue and control. And now instead of sowing distrust and discord, she's so busy talking about the Lord that she ain't got time to talk about so-and-so. It's great. And it's exactly what the issue is. What, what needs to happen, what needs to come out of your mouth is what's in your heart. And it's always going to happen that way. And so you gotta get your heart right. And again, that's what Jesus is talking about, but it works both ways. So if you're somebody who's false, false stuff is coming out. If you're somebody who's following, really following the Lord and in love with him, then that stuff's gonna come out. Verse 46, he says, but why do you uh, call me Lord, Lord, and, do not, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it for it was uh, founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. And so Jesus in this passage is talking about obedience. Now, now one of the things that, that happens when um, you're talking with Christians is sometimes um, Christians get this attitude that we don't have to do what the Bible says. And if you are adamant about the fact that you should do what the Bible says, people will call it legalism, okay? And so I don't wanna be legalistic. I wanna go with the spirit of what the Bible says, not necessarily the letter. 
well, how about this? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil for out of the abundance of the heart, the ma- his mouth speaks. Are there specific issues that need to be dealt with in that passage? And the answer is yeah. And if you just take the passage and you just eliminate it and say, well, I'm just going out after the spirit of it and you just make something up, then you're not obeying the passage. If it says, judge not, you shall not be judged, condemn not, you shall not be condemned, forgive and you will be forgiven. Well, there's specific teaching in that passage. And if I go, well, I know it says forgive and you'll be forgiving, but I got good reasons for not forgiving this person. Or I, said, I know that it says condemn not and you shall not be condemned, but I got really good reasons for condemning this person. And after all, I'm just going after the spirit of the passage, not what the, what the letter of the passage says. You know what that's called? That's just disobedience. That's all that is, is disobedience. We're supposed to obey Jesus. And so when Jesus talks about the ways that you handle a certain issue, you handle it that way. And if you don't want to do it that way, you are free to do that. God gives you freedom in all kinds of areas, and it's still disobedience. And so, um, you know, when, when Jesus says in verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not and not do the things which I say? Following Jesus includes obeying him. And so if Jesus had said to do something about a certain situation, it is to be obeyed. It's not to be judged. I don't don't come around judging Jesus on the things that he has to say. I'm not a judge of the word of God. The word of God judges me. You're not a judge of the word of God. The word of God judges you. And so it's a really good thing when you're going to your Bible and looking at what it has to say to just take it as it's stated and try to apply those things to your life. Now where legalism comes in is where people make up rules that aren't in the Bible, okay? And so you have some of that stuff with the Pharisees. Jesus never condemned the Pharisees for keeping Old Testament law. He never did it. In fact, Jesus, when he talked about the Old Testament law, he said, anyone who disobeys these commandments and teaches men so will be the least in the kingdom of God. And so he, did, he, said, he says that I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. And so we're not supposed, the, with the Pharisees, they weren't supposed to be people who did not do the law. So when the law says in the Old Testament that you're to keep the Sabbath holy, what are you supposed to do? Keep the Sabbath holy, which means that you rest on the Sabbath day. And so that was valid for the Pharisees to do. But what the Pharisees did was they came up with all kinds of rules about the Sabbath that had nothing to do with what the Bible said. So you couldn't, you know, for example, you couldn't, uh, if somebody got hurt, on the Sabbath day, you weren't allowed, you were allowed to, say they got cut, you were allowed to bind up the cut, but don't put any medicine on it because that's doing a work on the Sabbath day. Well, where does the Bible say that? And it doesn't say it anywhere. And you know, Jesus got in trouble with these guys all the time because he healed people on the Sabbath day and they had rules about healing on the Sabbath day. They had a certain amount of distance that you could walk. There was a, it was called a Sabbath day's journey. And there's so many steps that you could walk. Is that in the Bible? And the answer is no, absolutely not. What you're supposed to do on the Sabbath day were, was rest. And that was, the whole Sabbath thing was a picture of the rest that we were gonna have in Christ. So when you get to the New Testament, you know what your Sabbath is? It's not Saturday. It's Jesus is the Sabbath. He fulfills that. Jesus is the Sabbath. Jesus is the new moons. Jesus is the sacrifices. Jesus is the feast days. Jesus is all that stuff. And so he didn't come to um, disobey those things. He came to fulfill them. And so Jesus is my rest. When I come to Christ, I stop working and I rest in him. He's the one who does the labor and I just rest in him, allow him to work through me is the whole idea behind that. And it's a great picture. But legalism comes in when you start making rules that aren't in the Bible. Rules about what you wear at church, rules about, you know, uh, you know, I mean, you know what I mean. There's all this stuff that people come up with that are just rules and they're not in scripture. Doing what scripture says is obedience. It's not legalism, okay? And so Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? So we're supposed to be doing the things that Jesus says. And then he goes through and he talks about whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you whom he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep, laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood came, when the flood rose, the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. 
okay? Now, what a lot of people do with this, and I have done this too, is they take these passages and they go, Jesus is the rock. Is Jesus the rock? Yes, absolutely. Jesus is the rock. Um, the, the Bible talks about that. Is Jesus the foundation? Yes, he's the foundation. Is he the cornerstone? Yes, he's the chief cornerstone. And so all those illustrations can be in here, but when Jesus is talking about this, he's not saying your house needs to be built on me. He's saying that this house that he's talking about is built on the foundation of keeping the commandments that he's spoken. And so let me, let me put it to you this way. When I give my heart to Jesus, what happens is I become a child of God and I'm going to heaven. That doesn't mean my house isn't gonna fall down. I become a child of God and I'm going to heaven. That's what that means. If I, if, I, if I want my life to be something that's unshakable, something that will not fall apart, then what's going to happen, or going, what's going to have to happen is I am going to have to come to Jesus and hear his sayings and do them. It's not just coming to Jesus. It's coming to Jesus, hear his sayings and do them. And when that happens, then my life becomes this structure that's unassailable at that point. And it's not till that point. And the reason that I'm saying that to you is because I do lots of counseling and I talk with lots of people who are Christians and they come in and their lives are falling apart. And the reason they're falling apart is because they pay no attention to what Jesus has said. Or if they pay attention to it, it's just like this intellectual thing and they never apply it to their lives. It's happened in my life, it's happened in your life, it happens with people. If I do the same things that non-believers do, do I seriously expect that I'm going to get different results than non-believers? It's not going to work that way. But if I do things that Jesus says to do, Instead of things that non-believers do, I can expect a, a completely different result. And that's what he's talking about there. And so it's important that we walk in obedience to the Lord. And um, specifically in this context, he's, about, he's talking about the sayings that he just said. So you can go right back through the Sermon on the Plain here and go through all the stuff that he just talked about and begin applying those things to your life. And you can expect a completely different result than what you have in verse 49. He who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And that's the way that it's gonna go. I, again, I used to work in construction. The most important part of a building is the footing. It's the most important part. And you know, I, um, when, when, I was a, when I was a contractor, uh, either I was pouring my own footings or I was getting a concrete guy who was good. And I can, you know, there's still, a, you know, the concrete guy that was around here uh, when I was uh, working in construction, he's still around here and he's good. And it was one of those things where when I, when I would build on his footings, they would be absolutely square within an eighth of an inch. And what I'm talking about is you have a, a, have a big square uh, building or big rect rectangular building and you would measure across diagonally to see if the thing was square. That's the first thing that I always did with a footing because if it's not square, you have to snap lines, you have to hang things over so the rest of the house will be straight. Otherwise, stuff like wallpaper won't work out and stuff like sinks and cabinets won't work right when you get into corners and stuff. Everything's gotta be square. And so when I, when I came on a job and began framing, the first thing that I did was I checked the footing to see if the thing was square. And this guy was, I'll just give you his name, Ken Yuskowski, just awesome. That guy, when I would come out, like I said, within an eighth of an inch on a, on a big building, and it didn't matter what the turns were and all that kind of stuff, Ken Yuskowski got all my work because when I went to build on it, his footing was straight, and it was square and it was good, it was well done. And it was just a pleasure to build off of it. It's the same thing in a person's life. If you don't have a good footing, if you don't have a good foundation, then what's going to happen is everything that gets built on it, everything that you build on top of the dirt will look great. It'll look great, but it has no structure that holds it up. And what's going to happen is it will collapse. 
And that's the way it goes. Footing the whole, holds the whole building. And so again, it's the same situation in, in, in this passage. Jesus is talking about, again, look at verse 47. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them. If you'll do that, then you're gonna have a foundation that will not fail you. And that's the way that it's supposed to work. And so that's just a little um, exhortation to, to make sure that your house is built on rock instead of on the sand. And uh, again, when you, do, when, when you live that way, life is gonna be different. My life is radically different um, because I started, I decided I'm gonna start obeying Jesus. I was talking about it this morning and it was probably, um, you know, the, there was stuff that I was doing when I first got saved where it's like, I'm okay, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting God in these areas and I'm gonna do the things that God wants me to in these areas. But then it started getting to bigger issues. And when it started getting to bigger issues where, where things could really fall apart on me, it was one of those things where I, had, I just had to make choices. I had to decide. I'll, I'll tell you one story and then I'll let you go. Um, one, of the, one of the big ones was uh, when I bought my first house. And God had already taken me through some stuff, but... Um, oops. Um, um, when I bought my first house, it was, it was a spec house that my boss had built and he'd had it for a couple of years. I actually was renting it from him and uh, it wasn't selling. And so he asked me if I wanted to buy it. And I was like, sure, but I don't have a down payment. And so he said, well, you know, we'll work something out with the, you know, with the escrow company and stuff so that you don't have to make a down payment. I was like, you can do that? And he said, yeah. I go, okay, well, if you can do that, we'll do that. So we went, we went into this whole deal and uh, he was selling it with a partner. Um, it wasn't just his house, he was selling it with a partner. And one of the things I told him was, I'm not gonna lie on this whole thing. And so what ended up happening was uh, we went down and we talked to the escrow officers and all these, the, the bank guys, and actually it wasn't the bank guys, it was the escrow guys. Um, and I said, okay, I don't have a down payment. And so I can, can I buy this house without that? And the guy said, oh yeah, yeah, sure you can. And so anyway, what happened was the paperwork started going on and everything was, everything was fine until the day that we were gonna go down and try to get the loan. And I went down and talked to this guy and he said, um, you know, what's gonna have to happen is you're gonna have to give us a gift letter. And I said, what's a gift letter? And he goes, a gift letter is where you get somebody like your parents or, or Bobby's parents to sign a letter stating that they've given you the money for the down payment. And I said, I thought you were gonna work it into the loan. And he said, well, yeah, we're gonna work it into the loan, but we can't do that without a gift letter. And I go, well, her parents aren't giving me money and my parents don't have any money. And so that's, that's not happening. And he goes, well, it doesn't matter if they're giving you money or not. That's just what people do so that you can work it into a loan. So they lie so you can work it into the loan. And he said, well, yeah. And I said, I asked you if I was going to have to lie to do this. And he said, well, it's not really a lie. Everybody knows that you do it. And I go, I'm signing, my, I'm signing a letter that says that I got a loan from somebody. It's a lie. And so what ended up happening was I went, I'm not doing that. And so, you know, my boss was sitting there and his partner was sitting there and this escrow guy was sitting there and they're all getting mad at me because I won't do it. And I said, you told me I didn't have to do it. And so what you do is you send that loan in without the gift letter and see if they're going to give me the loan. And he said, they're not going to do that. And I said, fine, just send it in. I get a call from my boss that night and he's reaming into me going, why do you gotta be that way? Why do you gotta act that way? Why can't you just do the gift letter? And I go, because it's a lie. I'm not telling a lie. It's not going to happen. And so I thought I was going to lose my job over it. I thought I was going to get kicked out of the house and all, all this kind of stuff. And I, you know, basically I didn't really care. I, you know, I, I, I just gotten to the point where I just decided I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to do. And I don't care what people think about the whole thing. And so anyway, what ends up happening is I didn't get the loan. And actually I was absolutely fine with that because I had prayed about it and I didn't really want to buy a house at that point. I wanted to be able to leave if I wanted to leave. And so God had told me to go through that whole process and I was like, well, there God, I went through the whole process and it didn't work out, didn't have to buy the, didn't have to buy the house and all that kind of stuff. And I guess you wanted to see if I was just gonna do what you wanted to do. Then my boss calls me up and his partner calls me up and says, hey, 
uh, you know, the loan thing didn't work out. Um, how about this? We'll carry the paper on it and you can buy it from us. And I went, how's that work? Because I knew nothing about real estate. And they go, well, we'll just carry the loan and you know, you just pay, make payments to us and we'll take it off that. And I go, do I have to lie? And they, and they went, no, <laughs> you know, it's, it's our house and that kind of, it's basically the best deal you can get in real estate. And so what ended up happening was um, I was put in a position where everybody wanted me to compromise on this issue. And when I didn't compromise, when I decided I'm gonna do exactly what Jesus said, I'm not lying about this whole thing. When I didn't compromise on it, people got ticked off, people got mad at me. And it was a real trial for a little while. But then what God did was he turned the whole thing around and he blessed it. And he gave me the best deal that there was in real estate. So I buy the house and have it. We bought it at like $65,000. It was like a 900 square foot cabin for $65,000 down in, down in uh, California in the late 80s. I move up here and right before I moved up here, um, I only had the house for what, what, what was it, like two years? Something like that, two, three years. And it went from 65,000 to like 93,9 is what I sold it for. And so I made over 30,000 on it. When I moved up here, um, Bobby saw a house. It's the one that we're still living in. She saw a house and we got four acres, a 1600 square foot house, a, a detached garage with a, with a room and stuff on the back, barns and a, actually another mobile home and a stable and all this kind of stuff on four acres for 78.9. And so I ended up having like 30, you know, well over $30,000 because I'd paid down some of my loan and, you know, just came and bought this place. Rip and deal, it's where we start, started Calvary. And so the Bible study was in my home. The children's ministry was in the, uh, um, in the mobile home out back. And that's where the whole thing started. And I didn't realize that that's what was going on when God had me buy the house in the first place. But I never had to compromise I never had to compromise. And that's the point that I'm making. You do the things that God wants you to do and you do it without compromise and what God will do is bless it. Not everybody else will bless it, but God will bless it. And that's, that's where we live our lives. So let's end it with that and get you out of here. Father, thank you again, Lord, for your word. Thank you for these people. Thank you, um, Lord, that um, you've made it clear how life is supposed to go. And uh, God, we just pray that you would help us to walk in obedience to you. Um, Lord, the things that you've taught us, the things that you've shown us are things that are important and they will make our lives different. And so God, we just pray that you'd help us to do those things. Um, God, I thank you for these guys and for their heart um, towards you, their heart towards your word. And Lord, just pray that you bless them as they walk in obedience to you. We ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you guys.